days we look forward to diving deep into sustainability and other technology trends, including design. But tonight we'll start with mobility. So with that, I'd like to introduce our president and CEO, Mark Fields. Well, welcome. You're glad to be in San Francisco? Well, we <laughs> there we go. Well, we couldn't be more glad for you to join us here and also in Silicon Valley, which is the newest hotbed of innovation for Ford. And I also want to take the time to welcome our partners who have also joined us here this, this evening, especially Hewlett Packard, Spotify, Glimpse, and Pandora. So I really appreciate that you're all here. And today I know some of you had a chance to uh, visit our Research and Innovation Center in Palo Alto. And we're really looking forward to the rest of you getting a chance to see that uh, research center tomorrow. And I think uh, hopefully you'll find it very enjoyable. And from where we're at today at Ford, uh, we're on track in Silicon Valley actually to have one of the largest automotive uh, presences in the, in the valley by year end. And we're, we're, our approach here is how do we integrate ourselves into the innovation ecosystem or ecosystem that's in that area. So we really, really want to be part of the community. And speaking of that, we're very focused as a company. And we're focused on three priorities. Accelerating the pace of progress on our one Ford plan. Delivering product excellence with a lot of passion. And also driving innovation into every part of our business. And the Research and Innovation Center in Palo Alto is a very important part of all three of those. Now tonight, our innovation focus is on Ford Smart Mobility, which is, which is our way of using innovation to take us to the next level in connectivity, in mobility, in autonomous vehicles, the customer experience, and big data, all while creating value for the company. Because we view ourselves both as an automotive company and as a mobility company. And of course, we have to drive the business today, but at the same time, we have to anticipate and deliver on customers' wants and needs up to 15 years down the road. So what do we mean by a mobility company? It's a really important question. And simply put, it's more than just motion or from moving from point A to point B. It's really about human progress. And it dates all the way back to our founder, Henry Ford. You know, his affordable car put the world on wheels and made physical movement and mobility accessible to everyone. And it gave people actually the opportunity and the ability to pursue new experiences and expand their own economic opportunities. Because Henry Ford understood Mobility is really about freedom. The freedom to choose where to live, where to work, and where to play. And that freedom of mobility <laughs> helped make people's lives better for millions around the world. Now for the past few years, our company has actually been warning that that freedom of mobility is now actually being threatened and particularly in light of the four megatrends that are affecting the future of transportation. So let's go through those. The first trend, urbanization and the exploding urban populations. You know, today, there are 28 megacities, and those are defined as populations with 10 million people or more. And if we go out to 2030, so less than 15 years from now, we expect to see 41 megacities worldwide. That's a lot of people. The second trend, the rapid growth of the global middle class. You know, the global middle class is expected to double again by 2030, growing from 2 billion people all the way to 4 billion people. Now, Asia is going to drive a lot of that growth, but many in this middle class aspire to own a car. So that's just going to create additional challenges. The third trend, the health risk due to poor air quality and congestion. Nobody wants to breathe bad air quality. And finally, the fourth trend, changing customer attitudes and priorities regarding vehicles and transportation in general. So 
rather than sit back as a company and let's continue to study or let's worry about these things, at Ford, we're doing something about them. Because we see this as a huge opportunity, just as big as Henry Ford had in his day over 100 years ago. Because what we're seeing is software and connectivity technologies are driving vehicle innovation faster than ever. The clock speed on this stuff is incredible. And new, non-traditional partners and also competitors are now very, very interested in our business. And at the same time, we have a new generation of customers who are using technology to make their lives easier. And that's where Ford Smart Mobility comes in, linking us both as an automotive and a mobility company. And back in January, we announced more than 25 global experiments that we set out to learn what the future of transportation should be and also what we need to do to change the way the world moves, just as Henry Ford did it 100 years ago. Now, what's happened? Well, we have learned tons in the past several months. And tonight, we're sharing five areas of news with you. So the first area of news is what were the key learnings tied to some of these initial experiments? So let's talk about the first one. It's called Dynamic Shuttle. And basically, it was an on-demand shared transportation service. And what it revealed is how we could provide great customer in a shared van ride service using uniquely modified vehicles. In this case, it was a transit van. And we did it for test customers both in New York and in London. And here was the exciting discovery. People's attitudes on sharing. You know, people felt it was a positive, and in some cases, they actually celebrated it. Here were the five wants that we learned from folks. First, they wanted guaranteed maximum fares and travel times. They wanted some certainty. You know, they wanted adequate, uh, adequate you know, f personal physical space. They didn't want to sit right next to the, the guy who didn't take a shower last night. <laughs> you know, they wanted Wi-Fi. They wanted USB charging. And they want some storage for some of their small bags. So let's take a look at the vision. Our hypothesis was that people would like to use this service to be picked up from their front door and taken to the door of their destination. And we actually found out that they didn't want that because they had issues around privacy. Because of course, if they were being picked up from their door, there would be seven other passengers on board this vehicle that would all know where they then lived. So they kind of came to this efficiency agreement where they said, would you prepare to walk up to five minutes to a virtual stop that could be, of course, anywhere, because the system can dynamically route anywhere. Um, and that they were all happy to do that, because it meant a more efficient journey for all of them. So let's go on to the next experiment. It's what we call the InfoCycle. And it's really about how bicycles can best be used in urban environments to collect meaningful data. And we tested this both in Dearborn and in Palo Alto. Here are some key learnings out of that experiment. First, bike sensors can provide information about traffic patterns, pedestrians, and road conditions that's difficult to obtain from vehicle sensors. And so what we're going to do, we're going to expand this experiment. We're actually going to redesign the sensor box. We're going to make it smaller. And our plan is to have up to 1,000 InfoCycle equipped bicycles in service by the end of this year. Next experiment, data-driven insurance. And what we did here is we aimed to develop a score that could be used to enable customized driver-based insurance rates. So I'd like you to raise your hand if you believe you're a good driver. Just raise your hand. Okay. Now, let's check out the video. The uh, really interesting learnings from our project uh, is about over 90% of people, when you ask them if they are a good driver or not, 90% of people think they're good drivers, which, whether it's true or not, raises some really interesting challenges and questions for us when we're designing services that are about improving the way people drive. So just think about that. So here's what we learned out of this experiment. First off, people really liked receiving a score, right? They wanted to see how they're doing, they're competitive. What they don't like is being told what to do or being coached on how to drive. Also, we learned that the system works better if drivers see the benefits 
of improving their driving habits and are then rewarded for changing their behavior. So based on that, we're now pivoting our focus and we're applying these insights to help our customers with other potential mobility services. And we have more to come on that. Finally, car swap. Not to be confused with White Swap, the television show. <laughs> okay, this was a Ford employee car sharing experiment. And it was designed to really help to understand the social dynamics of car sharing. So what did we learn? First, the app is a really good icebreaker. It takes away the awkwardness of, let's say, a telephone call saying, Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'd love to borrow your car. You do it through an app. Secondly, we saw that each person seeking a vehicle also offered up their own, so nearly all of the swaps were accepted. And finally, what we learned is capturing the starting fuel level in the app made it a lot easier for users to return the vehicles with the same level of fuel that when they actually borrowed it. In conjunction with this, we also conducted two major parking experiments. And the first one was called Parking Spotter. And it leverages technology that's already on our vehicles. And it's really about our vehicles becoming probes that automatically find valid parking spots while driving and then feed that information and that data to the cloud. And we also married that to an experiment called painless parking. And it leverages all that connected car parking data that's in the cloud using analytics and then help beams it right back down to various drivers to help inform them on where they can park. So what did we learn from this? First, how to integrate a parking offer with city systems, really important. And secondly, we learned which parking pain points customers wanted to, to, to get rid of. For example, in London, a huge pain point is understanding where to park, how much it's going to cost, and how all that actually varies for the same exact spot over the course of the day. So those are some of the insights from the individual experiments that we undertook. So now let's step back and talk about the bigger picture. So we're announcing Ford Smart Mobility is transitioning from experimentation to the start of implementation, which is our second area of newsmaking. Now, of course, we're gonna, we're, we'll add experiments to occasionally you know, continue to better understand consumers' wants and their expectations. And we're now concluding more than half of the initial experiments and applying those learnings. And we're going to be transitioning some experiments into pilots. So here's an example. City driving on demand, a pilot. And we've launched what we call GoDrive. And this is a London car sharing service. So what we're doing is we have 50 cars, and we're going to put them in 20 locations across the city. And it features one-way rentals and guaranteed parking. What are the learnings? Well, customers absolutely love guaranteed parking. If you've been in London trying to find a parking spot, I think you know why. Because it removes that, that angst and that anxiety of hunting for an open parking spot. And oh, by the way, it has the, the additional benefit of saving fuel. At the same time, many customers really like being able to choose electric vehicles for car sharing. Now, there are also some smartphone app lessons that we learned. First, it's important to make it easy to use. It's got to be easy to find cars, to find the parking spot, and easy to understand the pricing. So, all great learnings, and it's just the start. So now what we're going to do is we're going to switch gears and focus on developing mobility solutions and services, starting with two key areas. Flexible use and ownership, and providing multimodal urban mobility solutions. So what's flexible use and ownership? Well, very simply, it's about exploring new ways for consumers to own vehicles in the, in, in the future and to use them in the future. Now, that could mean more car sharing initiatives, fractional ownership, and even pay-as-you-go transportation solutions. In addition to this, we did some really cool research. We uh, did some research with Gen Y and Gen Z folks. And they see the sharing economy as an opportunity to save money. They are really practical. And more than half 
say that saving money is the best advantage to sharing goods and services. 40% of them say it's the opportunity to try new products, and a third of them say having access to more options is a good thing because they like variety in their lives. So this leads us to our third news announcement, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing from Ford Credit. And we're really excited about this because what we're doing is we're providing customers the opportunity to rent their vehicles to others for short-term use, and that way they can save and they can earn some money. Now we're partnering with Get Around in the US and Easy Car Club in London. And what we're going to do is we're going to open this up to 14,000 uh, customers in six cities in the US and 12,000 customers in London. And the sign up runs through July 31st here in the US and through August 1st in London. So think about this. How, how would you want to picture it? Think about this as Airbnb for cars. Finally, multimodal urban mobility solutions. You know, in many cities, driving your personal vehicle from home to work simply doesn't work for people. And the journey might take two, three, or more different, actually, modes of transportation. And it really is a growing challenge. Because if you just look at the metrics, the world population is going to rise to 9 billion people by 2050. And that's up from 7 billion folks in 2010. And people living actually in cities is going to climb from 50% to 70% of the population in that time frame. 